Good morning, Grace Church. Why don't you stand up this morning? We're going to do a new song. We're going to worship him together in this place.
singing. For from you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, we sing again. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Come on. Yes, Lord. Come on, guys. Let's give the Lord a round of applause, Lord, for the Lord this morning. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, it is our, our great joy to, to gather, to sing of your worth. It is our great joy to put praise in our mouths as an expression of our gratitude and love. Jesus, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for all that you have done in our lives. And Lord, we commit to be a people that will continue to sing loudly of our praise and give witness of our gratitude for all that you have done. You are worthy, O oh Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Glad you're here. Do me a favor. Turn around and give somebody a high five, if you will. Give them a nice compliment. Tell them it's good to see them. All right, all right. If you go, go ahead and grab your bulletins. I want to highlight a couple of things. And... As we're doing that, just want to acknowledge, you know, a, little, a few little things here that we're working on. We apologize just on the, you know, some of you coming up McKelvey, it's going to be a little bit, I think, to all that straightened out and the traffic lights and not, this light out here just doesn't seem to cooperate in the way that would be helpful for us on a Sunday. So just be aware of that. We're working on it, talking with the county, see if we can't make that a little bit easier to get here. And then also we had a overflow of young kids today so some of you weren't able to get your kids in hey, it's a good problem to have but at the same time this is also a good idea to give a pitch to say hey we need to help and some of our a team to step up and serve in various areas of grace kids we do have the the little lively lounge just so you know if you're new around here there's a little lively lounge really nice and the service is fed right into it if you need it it's right outside those doors in the back but uh I, you know what? There's one other thing I wanted to say. Tim and Ashley, where are you at? Kavanaugh, where are you at? I don't see. Stand up for me. Hey, these guys have been serving here faithfully for years. Wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Celebrate recovery. I mean, working and helping people through addictions. And I mean, the um, awesome kind of work that you two have been doing. And he has just been recruited. You know, Pastor Cal that comes and, and preaches here regularly up in Peoria, Illinois. Well, he's going to go there and be one of the pastors there on staff, and they're going to go and serve in that area. And This is their last weekend with us, and these two have served so diligently. I'm telling you, I'm excited for the two of you to do that. Well, let's continue on here. Pull this out. I want to highlight a couple things. As you do, if you're newer, know there's a, a, a visitor card right in front of you, an easy way to interact with us. Ask questions. Put prayer requests on there. You can see where to, to, how to do that and interact with us. I really want to encourage you, to, if you really do have questions about Jesus, the church, the Bible, let us interact with you. Let us pray for you. And then also, those of you that come ready to give, tithes and offerings, we do that at the end on your way out. There's offering boxes to give that way. Or you can see on the screens a way to give. A uh, couple things here. Open this up. You're gonna, one of the first things you're going to see is this father-son uh, legacy weekend. We call it Sunright. We have an, a real important information meeting slash train dads meeting this Wednesday night. The retreat's not until September, but this training on Wednesday night, it's a mandatory thing for dads to come to if you're planning on going to the retreat with us so that we 
as dads know how to prepare for this father-son retreat. I, I can't encourage you enough to come and do this. Uh, this, this is something that you have to make happen. Move things around. Come and get away with your son for a couple of days and watch what happens. I've done this with my oldest for the last several years. It's, it's life-changing, life-giving in our relationship with our boys, helping our boys to become godly men in a godless culture. So I really want to encourage you to check this out. If you're still just wanting to lean in, we'll, we'll answer all your questions on Wednesday, but you really needed to make it. You can see the information there. Open it up one more time. You're going to see a big, uh, colorful ad there on the Mexico mission trip that we do. We do this every year around Christmas break. The information meeting is today, or right after church. You can see the information there. Again, maybe you're just interested. Again, that's something you could do with friends, family, neighbors, your fam uh, take your kids to. This is a, a, a trip that we go in an incredibly impo impoverished area, and we make huge impact. I mean, life-changing impact. And then you'll come away, and you'll see how much you have been impacted by what the Lord did through you and with the crew that you were with, you'll see how incredibly blessed we are. So many things happen. Even if you're a bit interested, you want to be at this meeting today as well. Um, amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for just the freedom to gather, to assemble, to praise your name, and to open the scriptures and to commit ourselves to the Lord. Father, we ask you that as we give of our time and talents, as we give of our tithes, that the name of Jesus would increase in fame right here in St. Louis. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Did you, uh, you apologize for the stoplight, right? I did, because I to told him you were out there messing with I'm... it last night trying to fix yeah, it. Right, I said, Ron, right, don't yeah. do that. You're going to mess it up for tomorrow. Jeez. So there, yeah. We're making it hard on you to get here. <laughs> but look, they're still here. Know, they all that's came. That's amazing. Push through. We, we, we were laughing. We went from seeker sensitive to seeker hostile. We're I guess. make it hard to get here. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Sound of Freedom? Wow. Look at that. That is pretty awesome. You guys know why it's a blockbuster. It's a compelling story about a child sex about child sex trafficking, which is the fastest growing international crime network in the US. It's second only to the drug trade. Kids, many under the age of 12, are kidnapped and sold as sex slaves. That's hard to absorb. I mean, good Lord. About 250,000 unaccompanied migrant children crossed our southern border in the last two years, bought, uh, brought here and sold here by Mexican cartels. Well, the movie's hero is Tim Ballard, a former Homeland Security agent with a heart to hunt down the bad guys and rescue those kids. You know, when I was a little guy, I, I, I used to put on a cape and pretend I was Superman because little boys have hero hearts. You know, they, they, they want to grow up to be men who rescue hurting people. They want to be firemen and, you know, policemen. God put that in the male psyche. And this verse in Ephesians 2.10 explains it. We won't get to, get to this this morning. I wanted to, but, but uh, Paul says here, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do God, good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wednesday night, we're gonna introduce you to another real life hero who is doing this stuff that we're talking about. Pat Bradley could literally have his own movie. Uh, he smuggled... Bibles into Russia and China brought food to the starving, dug wells where there was no clean water, built orphanages and medical facilities. He goes to places nobody else will go. He went to Sudan during their civil war. I mean, and if you know anything about that, I mean, good night. Afghanistan where he worked with the Taliban to the dark streets lined with young girls in the red light districts of Southeast Asia and East Africa. The thing that's different with Pat and a superhero is he, this guy makes no attempt to hide his humanity, his brokenness. I love his humility, his transparency. Pat was a divorced alcoholic when he came on a Tuesday night, back in the day, t to Grace. And uh, that was- Because he's from here. Right, he's from here. He's, he's from right here. So he was, he was here to gather information to get his ex-wife out of what he thought was a cult. 
That's what he thought we were. He said, I was going there to get custody of my kids because they weren't going to be raised around this stuff. So instead, he gets encountered by the Holy Spirit, gets miraculously saved. I mean, first time, first time. And his marriage is redeemed and they're remarried yeah, six months later. That's, um, my dad married him, put, put him back together. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, this, is just, this story just totally gets me. It's in his book. Uh, you know, he gets encountered. I, I think it was the very night, that, that very night, he goes to the bookstore and gets a book about reaching out to hurting people that really jump-started his call to the ministries. So here's, here's, here's what made the difference with Pat. He learned early on to say yes to the Holy Spirit and let him lead. He tapped that new creation power dynamic we talked about last week. In 2002, he started Crisis Aid International, and in the last 20 years, they've served more than three million people in 11 different countries, including 3,251 sex trafficking survivors. I mean, they built homes where they can recover, learn a trade, including one right here in St. Louis, which we are privileged to be able to partner with and support. My daughter and son-in-law went with them to their operation in East Africa. I'm blown away. I mean, Pat and Sue are the real deal. So we want you to just see a little clip of what they're doing. In passing, I heard girls talking about an organization that helped women in the same situation as me. Promising myself I would never go back to my old life. When I got the chance to come to Crisis Aid, I enrolled in this program. I really like living here, sharing life with my sisters with different personalities and backgrounds. Through a lot of help and counseling, I have completed the program. I am in a very good and healthy place for myself and my child. I was trained in clothes making. I am also learning about leather and waiting for my final results. I am in very good standing. I am very happy that I never went back to my old life. I have hope now. May God abundantly give you back and bless you for all that you've done for me. Thank you. That was Pat and Sue that you saw there. So, so Pat is going to be here Wednesday night, and the first 300 people who come will get a free copy of his book, Born for, Born for Rescue. Man, this thing is a page turner. You won't be able to put it down. You'll read it cover to cover in one sitting. You'll want everybody you know to read this book. Seriously, it's that, it's that good. It'll charge you. It'll challenge you. Pat says, I sincerely believe that being a Christian should be the greatest adventure on the planet, but too many people sit in church, bored to tears with their Christianity. It saddens me. They don't realize that their inaction is an action, that their lack of doing something is a vote for doing nothing. Doing nothing may feel neutral, but it supports and reinforces the status quo of whatever is happening. This is where the church is most backwards. I did many things wrong, and boy, if you read the book, he is honest about it. But I did keep saying yes. And after that, all I did was show up. He did the rest. That is, he wrote the parts of the story that made them worth telling. That's all you have to do. Just keep saying yes. So come Wednesday night, man. This is just. I spent two hours with this guy on Tuesday, and we could have went the rest of the day. Yeah. I was glued to this, the story. The so we're going to interview him and just pull some of these stories out that will provoke, convict, and then invite us. I love the tagline, finding purpose by refusing to do nothing. I love it. You're going you're gonna to start saying yes to God right. after you hear him. I mean, I listen to it in tears. Uh, 
I also keep encouraging you to, to read uh, Floyd Brown's book, Counterpunch, because this is so hopeful. Yeah. And Wes, you get to talk to him. Talk to him, interact with him. We're going to try to get him here. He is, again, he's just so clear-headed, but he's also clear-headed on the action of the church, what we can do, not just yelling at the darkness, but how we can mobilize as a church and really punch back, have a yeah. counterpunch. There's so much coming out, guys. Uh, we put two other videos that are actually movies on our webpage that will help you understand the strange things that are happening right now and how we are being brainwashed, gas, gaslit, and, and pushed into this mass psychosis that our country is in. It's why things are so confusing to people. It is, I believe this is the deception Jesus warned us about. This is the great uh, falling away and all that stuff. So it'll, it'll wake you up. So you saw Sounds of Freedom. I saw Sound of Freedom like many of you. It is worth watching because, again, it's sobering. I mean, I don't know if you caught what he said in, earlier on, but in America, this is the, uh, the number two growing crisis, people purchasing children for immoral purposes. In America, we would think, oh, you know, somewhere in some godless third world country. No, right here in civilized Western America, we need to be punched in the gut and to say, oh, God, what must we do? We have to get fired up and pray and press and spend money differently yeah. and ask the Lord for an absolute miracle because this is a devastation what's happening. We need to pray Psalm 2. All right, pray for Let's us. Pray. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to pray and present ourselves before the Lord and then open the Scriptures. Father, we thank you that we get to be alive right now. We thank you, God, that you give us grace and strength to overcome any kind of fear, any kind of anxiety. We thank you, you give us wisdom in what to do and power. Lord, we ask you now, open the scriptures to us, that our minds would be renewed and our hearts would be filled with faith. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Wes. All right, you can be seated. Uh, today, I want to move forward in our study, but first... Let's go back over just a little of what we covered last week. For Paul to use some form of in Christ 11 times in the first 13 verses of Ephesians tells us something's up here. I mean, this is really important. Uh, Jesus said it this way in John 15, 5. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Read this with me. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't think he's being figurative. I mean, we really have to understand what Jesus and Paul are talking about. It's a clear reference to Holy Spirit living in our born-again spirit and the necessity of us depending on him for everything. The whole Christian life comes down to this statement Paul makes in Romans 8, 6. He says, for the mindset on the flesh is still death. It's death, period. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. A believer has this new power, life dynamic within them. And to set your mind on that produces life. Paul saw the difference between the old and new covenants as the spirit of liberty dwelling in us. We mature as we learn to tap into his transforming presence. That's bottom line. Last week I gave you some tools for doing that. One was just a simple confession of truth where you hold up the mirror of his word, you ask him to illumine the new creation. I call it the beholding becoming principle. What you see is what you become. What the Holy Spirit illumines you're able to become. And Paul says even a dim beholding of this reality works. So every time you pick up the Bible or listen to it, you wanna say, Holy Spirit, give me the spirit, of, give me wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus. Show me great and mighty things in your word that I don't know. That's Jeremiah 33, 3. God says, call to me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things. So let's begin with that. And uh, I was gonna have you stand, but I, I think maybe just, just sitting there and, and looking at this and staring at it will help us. All right, so we're just gonna make the same confession we did last week, all right? Here you go. God loves me. Jesus is for me. The Holy Spirit is in me. I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, and I will reign in life through him. No weapon formed against me will prosper. And right now, I break my agreement with the lies of the enemy that say, 
I'm doing, what I'm doing is insignificant and that my life is making no impact. I am a success in God's eyes simply because I'm his. His hand is on me and I'm doing way better than I know. He's working all things together for my good. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I will keep his word coming out of my mouth and let it renew my mind till I'm enjoying him, enjoying me. My father delights in me. So I'm done stressing over things that don't matter and that I can't change. God's spirit is at work in me. And I'm being changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord as I behold his glory in me, even in a dim way. God is rejoicing over me right now with singing. Heavenly Father, I set my love on you. Now hold it right there. That is a powerful statement. Don't ever minimize or underestimate that statement. David's talking in Psalm 91 and he, well, we don't know whether it's David. We think it's, I think it's David, but they say it's older than David, so I don't know. But he said, he ends his psalm by saying, because he has, this is God speaking, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I'll set him on high because he's known my name. I'll, I'll uh, deliver him and honor him and show him my salvation. The, the whole gist of that statement is, because he has set his love upon me. So I, I say that a lot. Lord, I set my love on you today. I will love you, David said, O oh Lord, my strength. There is something powerful that happens when we simply make that declaration. God notices that stuff. So, so when we are saying this here, this is something to say throughout the day. All right, say it with me. Heavenly Father, I set my love on you, and even though it's weak, it's real, and I know it moves your heart. I commit to grow in love with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us light to see that today. Anoint your words on my lips. Give, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In Jesus' name. The Christians in Ephesus had been schooled in this new reality for two full years. Paul taught it every single day. And the result is the entire region of Asia heard the gospel. Here's what he taught. 2 Corinthians 5.17. This, this was Paul's main message. Read it with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So when Paul gets direct with these guys and he starts you know, telling them how to behave, they understood that he is reflecting the desires of the indwelling spirit because he hasn't changed gears. He's using the beholding becoming principle. He's, he's always going that, that route. He's saying, stay clear on who you are and who's living in you because if you lose that understanding, you're powerless. The, your, your power comes from this person who's living in you. Now, I'm going to tell you what this person's wanting you to do and, how, and, and showing you how he's wanting you to behave. But as you look at this, he's going to be the power source to make this happen. When Jesus taught his famous Sermon on the Mount, almost everything he told us to do is humanly impossible. I mean, it's just way beyond. He said, you heard it said, you know, do this. I'm telling you, get it right in your heart. So, you know, the disciples, I'm sure more than once asked this question in Matthew 19, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at him and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. He's saying, look, guys, without Holy Spirit, you can't even see the kingdom of God, much less do this stuff. Paul's revelation of the new creation helps us con connect the dots. The entire Christian life is humanly undoable. It's supernatural. We're called to live in connection with the spirit of liberty every step of the way. And he's always there for us. He's always on. It's like the third rail of a subway. As long as that engine is in touch with that rail that's electrified, it has endless power to move the train. All right, this, is, this week we're going to look at the first 10 verses of chapter 2, where Paul gives us the panorama of our salvation. We'll look into the past, get a glimpse of the present, and then gaze into our future. 
It's a snapshot of our graveyard to glory redemption that starts in sin, ends at the throne of God's grace. Paul begins with the nitty gritty of our pre-Christ days in verses one and two. You were dead in the trespasses and sins. And then he pivots in which you once walked. You were in Death Valley, but you ended up in Graceland. I mean, you're experiencing God's glory beyond your wildest dreams. In the first three verses, he explains what we're saved from. In verses four through 10, it's what we're saved for. He takes us back to our BC days. He gives us an honest appraisal of our condition. And then he tells us what happened. Here's the King James Version of Ephesians 2. It's, Paul says, and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath just as the others. And he's already told us what happens when you set your mind on the flesh. It's death. It's death, 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 death. You keep producing it. When we came into this world, we were DOA. I mean, all of us. We're alienated, separated from our creator. According to Paul, an unbeliever isn't sin sick. They're spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. They need more than a personality adjustment or a self-help program. They need a resurrection. That's why self-help and all this stuff can't fix anything. You can put an unbeliever in the best seminary on the planet and you'll just have an educated sinner. You know, you, you, you give him a billion dollars in his bank account and you'll have a rich sinner. But bring a person to the foot of the cross and you'll have a born again new creature who's received the gift of righteousness and eternal life. Paul says, you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. It all started with our original parents. When Adam and Eve sinned, they died spiritually and suddenly they were self-aware. Suddenly. They realized they were naked. They're, they're feeling guilt for the first time, which is the pain of sin. And their bodies began to die physically, emotionally, mentally. They were separated from God. They were afraid of him. Nobody, nobody had to tell them to be. Death had occurred and it spread to their children. It's exactly what God said would happen in Genesis 2. He said, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Romans 5.12, Paul fleshes it out. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin, for until the law, sin was in the world, but, not, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So let's follow that progression there. Sin entered, then death entered because of sin. Sin spread, death spread, and finally death reigned. That's how it went down. Sin entered, death entered, sin, uh, sin spread, death spread, death reigned. And the one word that describes it all is depravity. Doesn't mean we're as bad as we can possibly be, because you know there's some really nice people who are living in spiritual depravity too. Just means we're as bad off as we can possibly be. Depravity isn't our view of ourselves, it's God's view of us. If a non-Christian were to describe their life, they'd probably say, well, I'm not as bad as some people. I mean, lots of people are way worse than me, but God sees through all of that. <laughs> I mean, he looks right at the heart and the just messed up, junked up condition. He sees our depravity. If you're without Christ, you're as bad off eternally as you can possibly be. Listen to this. You are incompatible with heaven. You couldn't exist in the heavenly city. The light would blind you, it would torment you, it would, it would burn you. That's why we wanna warn people about hell. It's a real place people will go who reject the gospel. People choose hell. God made a way of escape. God doesn't send you to hell, you send yourself to hell by not receiving the, the gift, by not receiving his grace. All right, Paul paints this picture in Romans 3, 9. What then, are we better than they? 
Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin as it is written. Get ready, because here's, here's God's perspective. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is no, none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they've not known. There is no fear of God before, our, before their eyes. In one paragraph, Paul answers the why question. After thousands of years of technology and progress, why is the world still so messed up? 2,000 years ago, Paul told us, it's our sin nature. We're all sinners. People are not good. The oligarchs, the globalists are saying we are. They're liars. We're all broken to the core. And he's, you know, lifting these statements from the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Old New Testaments are tightly connected. How many of you have a, a cross-reference Bible? You even know what I'm talking about there? Well, okay, so you, you can learn so much by checking out, you know, a, a cross-reference Bible with, for the insight into what you're reading. We just read Romans 3.10 where Paul says, as it is written. Well, he's not quoting Aristotle or Plato or some Roman historian. He's quoting the Bible. He's quoting David in Psalm 14, 1 through 3, along with five other Old Testament passages. So if you have a study Bible with cross-references, they'll show you all of them, but still, also, a number of the Bible apps that you have, like Version and others, uh, will do the same. And if you go and you read what Paul's referring to, the Holy Spirit will give you a far greater understanding of what he's trying to say. Last time we talked about, you know, just the miraculous, transforming power of God's Word. A PhD student in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon uh, by the name of Chris Harrison teamed up with a Lutheran pastor some years back to create a diagram of cross-references in the Bible. You're seeing it there. They found 63,779 connections, and they graphically depicted them there. The Bible has, think about this, has 66 books with one theme written by some 40 authors over 1,500 years. That's, that's miraculous. And there's no contradiction. Look at, what, look at how tightly connected it all is. Jordan Peterson used this in the his Bible lecture series. He called it one of the coolest things he's ever, ever seen. He's saying the Bible can be thought of as the first hyperlink book. We put that on our resources page for you guys. All right, back to Ephesians 2. Paul's saying, we were dead in sin because when Adam sinned, he generated an organic change in his human DNA. And it affected both his nature and character. At that moment, he went from innocence to sinfulness, and that became the human condition. He and Eve spread sin and death to all of mankind. Jackson Lake, Wyoming, it lies right in front of the Grand Tetons. Debbie and I drove out there years ago. It's, it's a gorgeous sight that you just come up on as you're driving west, and on a crisp, clear morning, it looks like a mirror. Uh, you can't tell the difference between the mountains in the distance and the mountain reflected in the, the, the lake. It's just this perfect mirror image. But it only takes one little flat stone skipped across that lake to ripple the image. And that's what Adam did. He threw one stone into the lake of humanity and marred the image of God from that moment on. Sin entered, death entered, sin spread, death spread, death reigned. That's our condition, that's our nature. It's like, you know, accidentally grabbing salt when you wanted to add sugar to your iced tea. You can't get it back. Your tea is ruined. I mean, you have to dump it. As it's, you're not going to do anything with it. That's us. We're all sinners by nature, fit for nothing but a godless hell. Verse 3 says, we were by nature children of wrath, just as the other. So practically speaking... An unbeliever has no capacity for understanding spiritual reality. That's what gets you so frustrated when you're talking to, to, to one. That's what Paul writes in, 
In, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, he says, the natural man does not receive or understand the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You can give them a Bible, and they'll say, I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. It just seems, it's all Greek to me. And they're right. Without God's Spirit opening your spiritual eyes, you can't see it. It's like talking to a corpse. The corpse can't see, hear, respond, or do anything to improve his condition. He's dead. Stick a pen in him, he feels no pain. He doesn't feel bad at all about being a rotten mess, about stinking to high heaven. You have to be born again to recognize what a train wreck you are, right? I mean, you get born again, you go, God, I'm a mess. I couldn't see it. Till that happens, you're dead in trespasses and sin. And once you're dead, you can't be more dead. Because people say, you know, yeah, but he is way worse than I am. He sins tons more than I, doesn't matter. You're both dead. In the movie, The Princess Bride, you probably remember when Andre the Giant and Inigo Montoya take Wesley to Miracle Max for the miracle chocolate pill. Inigo says, we need a miracle. Our friend is dead, Billy Crystal's Miracle Max. And he says, well, I'll have you know, your friend isn't all dead, he's only mostly dead. And everyone knows the difference between mostly dead and all dead. Well, just for the record, we are all spiritually dead in the total sense of the word. Not mostly dead, not a little dead. There's no such thing. I'm, I'm not a better dead sinner than some other guy. Before Christ, we're all dead with a sinful nature. Look at, look at it again. Verse one says, we who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now, that's an interesting statement. Trespasses and sins. You ever read that and wonder if Paul's being redundant? Like, you were dead in sins and sins? He's actually using two different words there, making a distinction. The Greek word hamartia is used 173 times in the New Testament to mean miss the mark. It's an archery term that means to fall short of an assigned target. The idea is if I shoot 20 arrows, 19 miss, and one hits the target, the one doesn't count. I miss the mark 19 times. I'm a sinner. But let's say you shoot every single one into the bullseye but one. You're still a sinner. And you say, yeah, but I got 19 in the bullseye. That only means I'm a better sinner than you are, but you're still a sinner too. You missed the mark. You know, and, and according to God's standard of perfection, that puts us all in the same boat. But a trespass is something different. It's a different kind of offense. It means to cross a known boundary. It's a deliberate, willful act of disobedience. So let's say you're, you know, your young son, uh, you know, comes in and with muddy shoes and walks all across your newly washed floor. That's a little boy being a little boy, not paying attention. So he gets a pass with a warning, kitchen floor still a muddy mess, but that's what sin does. It just messes everything up, so you tell him, don't do it again. And he gives you this impish grin and continues to march around the whole house with his muddy shoes. Well, that's a trespass. He now knows better. And Paul says, we're guilty of both. We're, built, we're guilty of both. Verse two says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, he's talking about Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That word walked is a, a Bible word that often means the way you order your behavior. It's a Greek word, peripateo, meaning to walk around or about. It's some times translated meander or browse, like wandering with no goal or purpose. Did you ever meander through a store and end up buying stuff you didn't need? A story of my life. Tell the salesman, I'm just browsing. <laughs> it's a dangerous thing to say <laughs> or do. And it's what I, I do when I go to the grocery store hungry. I'll come back with bags full of stuff that I didn't need. Paul's saying, you used to do that. You used to browse the world, meandering through life without a goal or purpose, whatever the wind blew. You were like tumbleweed, you know, getting blown around by the latest fad or whatever your peers were into, just going along to get along. Explains all this craziness, this violence and vandalism and, 
and stealing that we see happening in our city cities right now and stores out in California. I mean, I think they're going to have to shut down malls out there. It's just crazy. I don't know, officer. Somebody just handed me this brick. I, I, I threw it to get rid of it. Yeah, right. No, no. We are capable of stuff that we can't even imagine. We are, we are broken to the core. And when we're, you know, in that go along to get along mode, we're really in trouble. In verse three, Paul says, among whom we, he's lumping us in with the sons of disobedience here, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of what? Of wrath. One translation says objects of God's wrath, just as, just as everybody else, just as others. There's an old fable about a scorpion and a frog. A scorpion said, I'd like to cross the river. I'll hop on your back, and you can, you can take me across. The frog said, you'll sting me while I'm swimming, and I'll drown. The scorpion said, dear frog, if I were to sting you, you'd drown, and I'd go down with you. What's the logic in that? So the frog thought about it and said, okay. The scorpion hopped on. Halfway across, he stung the frog. And as they sank, the frog said, why'd you do it? The drowning scorpion said, it's just my nature. There's no logic to our sinning, is there? It's just who we are. We sin by nature and by choice, but primarily by nature. That's why we need redemption. What the first Adam messed up, the second Adam fixed up. Jesus became one of us and died as the only innocent human to give us a new nature. Because that was the only thing that could change us. If a dog barks, we don't say it's a dog because it barked. It barks because it's a dog. Just like we don't say that person is a sinner because he sinned. No, he sinned because he's a sinner. That's his nature. That that nature will eventually come out. I don't care how good you look on the inside, uh, on the outside. Verse four contains maybe the two greatest words in the Bible, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. (laughs) Those two words are the most eloquent, inspiring transitions in all of literature. We're hopeless and helpless, but God. We're sinking in the mire of our filth, but God. Our lives are bleak and dark and falling apart and we're in all kinds of addiction, but God. In Romans 5, 7, and 8, Paul says, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die, but here it is, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, we weren't seeking him, We weren't saying, oh, Jesus, if you'll just come and do it, I'll be your bestest friend. (laughs) No, we were still running, doing our own thing, going our own way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, there are a lot of but God moments. All through the Bible, in in the Old Testament, Joseph was abused by his brothers in just 17, when they sold him as a slave, ended up in an Egyptian prison for 13 years. After years of suffering, God elevated him to a unique position of power in the government, gave him tremendous wisdom to supply food for the land in a devastating famine. When Joseph's brothers end up coming to Egypt to buy food, he met them again, they're terrified. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, he, he, he could say, as for you, you meant, you meant evil against me. You absolutely intended this. But God, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You know, that is the testimony of every Christian. This is who I was. This is what I used to do. This is how I used to think, but God, he intervened. He came to my rescue. That's our past. Look at our present again, verse six, verse four. <clears throat> but God, who is rich in mercy, Even when we're dead in trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And here's the the present. And raised us up together 
and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There it is again. Another in Christ statement. That's our new identity. That's our new position of authority. We were bought and purchased out of sin at the price of Jesus' lifeblood. Paul mentions the words mercy and grace. And although they're related, they're different. In fact, there are three words that we should know. Justice, mercy, and grace. Justice means you get what you deserve. Mercy means you don't get what you deserve. And grace means you get something you don't deserve. So let's say you're driving through all the construction in rush hour. What is going on in St. Louis right now? I mean, this is absurd. Did they just decide to fix everything in one month? I mean, you just want to get home, but it feels like the wild, wild west, you know. Like sitting at the stoplight for half an hour over here, you know. Justice, you know, is what you want for everybody else. You want to speed, zip in and out, and get away with it. But if somebody cuts you off, immediately, immediately, you're saying, where is a police officer when you need them? (laughs) You know, that person just broke the law. Send in the police. Catch that guy. You want justice for lawbreakers because that's what they deserve. But let's say you're speeding. An officer pulls you over and says, you were doing 15 over the speed limit, and he gives you a ticket. That's justice. That's justice what you deserve. Five miles later, another officer pulls you over and says, my radar has got you going 80 and a 55. You deserve a ticket, but I'm gonna give you a warning. That's mercy. He's not giving you the punishment you deserve. And man, are you relieved and glad and thankful. So what does grace look like? Well, actually, I've never heard of this happening. But grace would be a policeman pulling you over for doing 90 and a 60, writing the ticket, and paying the fine for you. That's grace. He's giving you a total gift. You you don't deserve it. Justice gives us what we deserve. Mercy withholds the punishment. Grace goes beyond and gives us what we don't deserve. So if you're thinking this through, you're probably wondering, okay, so how can God be both? How can he be just and merciful at the same time? <clears throat> because if God is just, he has to punish sin, right? If he's merciful and doesn't, wouldn't that negate his justice? Yes. But here's what you're missing. Whenever God extends mercy, he always punishes the sin. Always, always, always. It's what happened on the cross. God poured out all the punishment that you and I deserve on Jesus. He judged our sin in the sinless body of his human son on a Roman cross so that he could extend mercy and grace to us. At the cross, guys, justice was served once and for all. Anybody can come and freely receive it. At the cross, mercy was extended. At the cross, grace was poured out. We get abundant life now and the joys of heaven forever because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So when you hear the word mercy from a biblical perspective, it's never grounded in sentiment. It's always grounded in sacrifice. That's the idea. Verse five again. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our present position and spiritual address. We're in Christ, seated in heavenly places. Paul said it in Ephesians 1.3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 20, 21, by his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's saying Jesus Christ is seated above all spiritual authorities, demonic forces, angels, both good and bad, in a place of omnipotent power. And because we're in Christ, we share the benefits. Doesn't mean we're omnipotent, that we're never tempted or immune to trouble. It just means God's power is always available to us. 
We don't have to be the devil's dartboard. We are seated in a place of authority over him and his demon minions, and they have to obey us when we speak in the name of Jesus. Well, <laughs> I still get excited about this stuff. Nice. Man, I'm telling you. <clears throat> Glad none of y'all were sitting any closer. <laughs> Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now he's talking about our future. God's going to display the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness to us. The purpose of God for your life goes beyond heaven. I mean, <laughs> this is crazy. It's more than a destination. It's gonna be an unveiling, an unfolding of who God is every moment forever. It's gonna take God all of eternity to show us how great he is and how much he loves us. Psalm 16, David, David gets a view of it. He, he declares, in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. When my dad was dying, he got a glimpse of heaven. He said, oh, the joy, the joy, the joy, the joy. <laughs> and he kind of came back to himself and said, put me back there. I looked at him and said, dad, that's not legal. We can't do that. We can't kill you. But he saw the angels, he saw heaven, he saw the beauty. Verse eight, for by grace you have been saved. Now we're getting to the bedrock of what this really means to be a Christian. For by grace you have been saved. That encapsulates it all, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are Christians solely as a result of God's grace. Nobody can say, well, you know, I was born into this really good Christian family, all right? You know, I've been a moral person all my life. That's not, that's not enough. We're Christians solely because of what God's done. God knows how much our old nature wants the credit. It's the very thing that tripped up his highest ranking cherub, Lucifer. In Isaiah 14, Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. I want people to recognize me. I want to be worshiped. Verse 12 says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, who did exalt yourself, looking for glory. God understands this all too well. This is he, he gets this part of our sin nature. So he plays salvation way beyond our human ability. I think that's what the whole Sermon on the Mount was about, to show us how impossible it is. He based it all on his grace through the finished work of Jesus Christ and the simple act of me believing, and he even gave me the faith to believe it. He drew me in, placed that spark in my heart to believe so I could receive his grace and the gift of eternal life. It's not of works, Paul says. He's talking about your salvation, unless any man should boast. Think about how every religious system is built on the principle that if, if you do enough good things, good things will come to you in return. Even non-religious people say, the meaning of life is just try to be a good person. You know, the truth of the gospel is so counter-religious, so counterintuitive, it begins with the recognition that you and I can never produce enough good to earn our salvation. We are incapable of being good. We are broken to the core. But God provided salvation as a gift of grace. All right, so we started in Death Valley and ended in Graceland. But some of you are still in Death Valley. Right now, you are headed for a very real place called hell. And I feel real compelled to tell you it's a horrible place. It's a place beyond your wildest imagination. You will never see a movie that will depict it accurately. It's a place of torment. God will not force you to trust Jesus. You cannot spend eternity in a place that you are in incompatible with. You cannot go to heaven 
in your fallen condition. So the fact that you are listening to me right now is God's gift to you. Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to see your dead spiritual condition, your sin, and giving you the grace to repent, to receive the gospel, to believe. Now I'm gonna bottom line it for you in six sentences. These words are the words of eternal life that can begin your transformation. In fact, I want you to read them with me. All right, number one, read it with me. God created us to be with him forever. He made us in his own image. He breathed his own life into us. But a relationship can only exist when it's mutual. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed God's one command, they broke trust, they died spiritually, and their sin and death spread to the whole human race, and we are all born dead with the sin disease. Number two, ready? Our sins have separated us from God. The minute they disobeyed, they were immediately afraid and hid themselves. Nobody had to tell them it's the human condition. They can no longer be near a holy God who's a blinding light and consuming fire where sin is present. Three, ready? And those sins cannot be removed by any good deed or act of contrition. God looks at our hearts, he sees even our best stuff, even our best deeds, our filthy rags full of duplicity, so he fixed the problem by sending his own son to become one of us forever. That's what happened. Four, ready? Jesus came to die as the only sinless human to pay the full price for all those sins. A legal exchange took place in the court of heaven. The Bible says it this way, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, God, made Jesus, him, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the most phenomenal event in human history. God, God's only son was born of a woman to become the only perfect human so he could become the perfect sacrifice. Colossians 2.14 says, God was nailing our sins to Christ's cross so that he can now be right in making us right. That, oh my goodness. That, you know the Bible says the demons didn't see it, they didn't know it, or they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They had no idea that Jesus had absorbed our sin because he was a sinless man. He had absorbed our sin and he was paying the full penalty. They had no idea till he was resurrected what they had done. They had nailed our sins to Jesus Christ. They had, he had borne our punishment so we could receive forgiveness. Okay, so number five, ready? Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Those were his words. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, says the same thing, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Believing in Jesus alone. Believing in Jesus alone. Believing in Jesus alone is what gives us eternal life. No other religious leader said that. And it gets better, all right? Number six, read it with me. Eternal life is supernatural life that begins now and lasts forever. In John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. When you trust in Jesus, he comes into your life to stay. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That was his promise. Those were his words. And Holy Spirit will free you from the fear of death, the slavery to sin, your slavery to addiction. You won't just know about Jesus. You'll actually come to know Jesus. You'll develop a deep friendship with him that lasts forever. And you know what? It can begin right now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you can hear his voice, if you can sense any of what I'm telling you is true, suddenly, your eyes are open. You want to call on the Lord, the Bible says, while he's near, while he's drawing you to his son. If what I'm saying makes sense, Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to the truth. He's giving you faith to believe, faith to be born again spiritually, and you'll know what happened. You'll know this is true because your dead spirit will come to life. Like Pat Bradley, I mean, it, it just, everything shifted, everything changed. There's not a single person here by accident. Not a single person watching this, listening to this. This is a holy moment. He's inviting you to be a member of his eternal family. 
All you have to do is respond. Let's bow our heads together. If you want to know that your sins are forgiven, that you're a member of Christ's family, that you're going to heaven when you die, here's how you get it settled. Jesus said it this way. He said, you've got to acknowledge me. You've got to acknowledge me before men. If you want to acknowledge me before men, I want to acknowledge you before my Father. This has got to be real. This has got to be something that you're not just saying, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do it, you know, my own little way. No, 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 you need to do it right now and acknowledge it. So I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it easy. All I want you to do is just raise your hand and say, I, you know, I'm not sure where I'm at. I want to know that I know that I know that I've crossed the line of faith. I want in. I want to know that I'm a believer and that I'm born again. And I don't have that assurance right now, but I want that assurance. How many of you just cross the room? I've got my, people are praying right now. How many of you would just raise your hand and say, I want in, I want in. Man, I see hands going up. Anybody else? I mean, do it now, do it now, act on this. All right, I see a bunch of you. All right, let's, let's stand up on this one. God, right now, we're asking for a miracle, for that miracle that every one of us here that has accepted Christ have experienced, that miracle of rebirth, of resurrection. Holy Spirit, would you come now? Would you come now? Would you come and do what you love to do? Be the spark that ignites eternal life in the spirit of every person, God, who is about to confess these words. All right, we're gonna say this together. We're gonna say it out loud, all right, all together. Jesus Christ, I put my trust in what you did for me on the cross. I give up trying to fix myself. And I surrender total control of my life to you. I repent of my sins. Save me. Resurrect my dead spirit. Forgive me. I receive it. I receive your gift of eternal life. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and fill me so I can love you and know you and follow you with my whole heart. Jesus, I confess you as Lord as my king, and I thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen, Lord, thank you for doing it right now, right now, right now. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I didn't feel anything. It's not a feeling, it's not a feeling. But when you open the Bible, it's gonna be 3D. Amen. Amen. You're gonna look at it and go, I never saw this. Amen. I never understood this. Some of you are gonna get touched real strong emotionally. You find yourself weeping and wonder what in the world's happening to me. Yeah. Spirit of God has come to live in you. He's healing you. He's healing old wounds. He's, he's changing you. He's doing it. Right now, Lord, let's just, let, let's just think for here, here for a minute. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, right now. Right now, touch people emotionally. Touch them in their soul. Touch them in their mind. Heal wounds from the past in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now those of you who are here, unfortunately you have a little advantage over those that are watching. We're gonna have our prayer team come forward and they're gonna be up here just to, just to bless you. And they've got something they wanna give you. If you watch this online, just text commit, the word commit to, to this number you're seeing, 314-310-0314. Uh, and, uh, and we wanna send you something, congratulate you, help, help you in your new walk with God, because that's what this is. All right, we're gonna end by singing this song Y'all all know this when singing with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I was, was lost, but now I found. Was blind, but now I see my chains. My chains. continue to sing and this is going to be kind of a soft introduction or soft benediction sorry I knew there was a word there uh, remember a couple things Pat Bradley's going to be with us Wednesday night we start early on Wednesday nights at six the plan is that you could come here directly from work have dinner at the cafe if you would like and 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 man good food out there sheesh they are really killing it and then uh you know, be part of the worship and the service that starts at six. But uh, man, you won't be sorry for being here Wednesday night. And next week, I'm gonna continue on Ephesians. Parents, if you would, you know, ease out and, and pick up your kids, and we're gonna sing this a couple more times and just have a soft dismissal. Uh, if you need prayer, if you want prayer, if you prayed that prayer, come down, let them give you something, let them pray for you before you leave, all right? God bless you all, see you back here. <laughs>